Good morning. Welcome to Emmanuel Baptist Church. We're glad to have you with us again today. We are walking through, studying the book of Revelation. We're about to encounter Jesus Christ, uh, write letters to seven churches, and ultimately to his church, which includes us. These letters are meant not only for the churches who are here at the time of the book of Revelation and the time of John as he writes, but they're letters also for us. Before we get to chapter 2 and 3 where those letters are, are written, we encounter Jesus Christ very powerfully, very specifically here before he's going to show us his character. He's going to show us again, he's going to reveal to us the certainty that we have in him as he then calls us to holiness and calls us to faith, to walk in faith. The book of Revelation is all about Jesus Christ transforming all things. We are in chapters uh, 1, 2, and 3 right now. And... Uh, and so he's, John is writing about the things that he has seen. What has he seen? He has seen Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, who is now ascended to heaven, who has risen. He's in the presence of his Father. Now he's ministering to his church then and now. He sees a glorified Jesus Christ. It, it, is, it is a game changer. Uh, as far as John's perspective, what he sees, what he's able to be allowed to understand and see, is to us, it just shows us so much about what lies ahead and the certainty that we have in Christ. What an encouragement this passage is. And so we see the power, the sufficiency of Christ in the verses we're going to be in today. We're going to be specifically uh, in verses 12 through 20 today. What we're going to see today is simply the divine power of Jesus Christ. It's, it's uh, revealed here in the attributes, the qualities of Jesus Christ himself. What we see in the verses that unfold are, are simply descriptions of, of our divine Savior, of Jesus Christ today. And they stand as the foundation for what he's about to write. So let's look at these this morning and see what he has to share with us. Uh, they will speak to us, and they're true today. Uh, they, are, they are reasons why we continue to follow the Lord faithfully today, because these things are true of our Savior right now, and they call us to faith, they call us to certainty, to give us assurance and hope, because he's the same Jesus then as he is today, the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. The first thing that we see as we begin in verse 12 is that Jesus Christ is indeed the head of the church. John says, Then I turned to see that a voice was speaking to me, the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands there was one like a son of man, he is, he is here referring to himself as the Son of Man. Uh, it's a title that he frequently used in the Gospels. It shows his humanity. And then here he's also being equated uh, and revealed the divinity that he has as well. He's in the midst of these seven golden lampstands. We see later in verse 20 that these are, these are the churches. And so Jesus Christ, he is here in the, in the middle of his church. The significance of that is... Jesus is revealing to us before these letters are read that he is the authority of the church. He is our authority even today. Colossians chapter 1 reminds us of that. Paul writes he's the head of the body in the church. Then everything he might have preeminence. Because God chose that all his fullness would dwell in Christ. He is worthy of all praise, of all authority. He is to be preeminent in our life and in our walk today. So he's revealed here in this verse as, as indeed the head of the church. Um, Daniel, John refers often to the book of Daniel. It's built on that. We see here Jesus Christ. We see the Father. There was one like the Son of Man, that's Christ, who came to the Ancient of Days, that's the Father, and was presented before him. In Daniel chapter 10, verse 5, we have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who are thrown into the fiery furnace. And yet when the king looks into that furnace, they're not only alive, there are not only one, two, and three, but there is a fourth, one like the Son of the gods, that's Jesus Christ here. Again, a reference point in Daniel that we see that's in harmony with what John is revealing here in the book of Revelation. And so John shows us right off the bat, Jesus Christ in the midst of these lampstands, the lampstands who have a lamp, who are intended to be a light in a dark world, that is us, that's the church today, we are part of the church. We're intended to be ambassadors for Christ, a mouthpiece for Christ, to share the goodness, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Here, Jesus Christ is right in the middle of his church, watching, guarding, leading. We're going to see all that. Not only that, but as we pick it up in verse 13, we see that he is our high priest. He is clothed with a long robe. 
and with a golden sash around his chest. That's the, that's the image, that's the picture that we get here of, of Christ, the Son of Man. And again, it, re, it reminds us that Christ is the one who gives us access to the Father. He is our high priest. He gives us the ability to come to the Father because of his work on the cross. When we share the gospel and the good news of Jesus Christ, that's where it begins, is that Jesus Christ is, is the means of relationship with the Father. We see that clearly in the scriptures in 1 Timothy, he is, a me he is the only mediator between God and man. He is the one, when we confess our sins, he is, the, he is the one who forgives us our sins. He is the one who cleanses us from our sins. That is, that is the priestly function that he's carrying out. He cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And then he, he gives us the confidence that we ourselves might have access to the Heavenly Father. That we, we then, uh, we're, we're, we're taught in the Scriptures that we are also priests before God. We have, in other words, we have access through Jesus Christ to the Father. In Exodus, we're reminded as, the, as God established the priesthood in Israel, Aaron was to make a, a special clothes, garments, uh, that he would wear as the high priest. These were holy garments. When he went into the Holy of Holies, there were many stipulations that needed to take place. One of those stipulations was what he wore. He would put on a holy linen coat, have a linen undergarment, tie a, a linen sash around his waist, wear a linen turban. These are holy garments. We, again, we just see Jesus Christ as he's portrayed in Revelation. He's, he's wearing the, that clothing that is consistent with his function, his role, as our high priest, as the high priest. <clears throat> in Daniel, again, we see this. We see Jesus, a, a man who is clothed in linen with a belt of fine gold. There's contexts here in these verses. And the, we see the Father. He is the Ancient of Days in chapter 7. His clothing was white as snow. We see that attributed both to the, to the Father and the Son, the way they are portrayed, the garb that they wear, and the portrayals here in, in, in uh, Daniel. We're told in Hebrews that Jesus Christ is indeed your high priest, my high priest. He is our high priest. He's merciful. He's faithful. Um, and so he, he gives satisfaction to his Father for us, for, for our sins, so that we can come to him. We can be in relationship to him. Now, the beautiful thing here in Revelation is that Jesus Christ, he's, he's built the church. He's walking among the church. He's the head of the church. He's our high priest. He gives us the ability to be in relationship with his Father. It starts with him. It continues with him. When we need to, to be right with God, to have a clear conscience before God, to be in, in true fellowship and communion with God, we lay our sin before him even now. And Jesus Christ, on the basis of his role as high priest, he washes our sins, he cleanses our sins, he keeps us in right fellowship with the Lord. That's what he does. In verse 14, we see this, that he is, he is indeed not only the high priest. In that role, he is our righteousness. He is our holiness. Verse 14, and the hairs of his head were white, like white wool and like snow. This can, return, this can refer to uh, sometimes uh, show the eternal attribute of Christ or that he's all wise. But what it seems to be referring to probably more specifically in this context as high priest and where we're going is, is the fact that... that uh, uh, it's indicating and showing his righteousness, his holiness. Jesus Christ is absolutely holy, and he is righteous. Uh, he is the one that gives to us the character of righteousness. He is the one who makes us holy. You know, sin just defines us. Sin is where we were when we met Jesus Christ for the first time. And Jesus Christ washed that and cleanses that. He continues to do that in our life today. And he makes us holy. He makes us right with God. He allows us to be able to enjoy fellowship with Him. As we come to the Father, we come in the name of Jesus Christ. As we pray, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. He is our authority. He's the authority over sin in our life that we might be clean and right before Him. The significance of that is Jesus Christ Himself, himself He calls us to purity. We're going to see that in His letters. Isaiah 1.8 Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. The very description of Jesus Christ himself. He makes us this because that's what he is. You know, in our life, sometimes we feel like we just can't get out from under the scars or the junk or the sin in our life. You know, Jesus Christ, he is the one who enables us to do that. 
He becomes our righteousness and our holiness. And He washes away the stuff that we can't wash away. What a beautiful Savior. In Daniel, we see a, a, a portrayal of the Father. And He is the Ancient of Days. He takes a seat. His clothing is white and His hair on His head like pure wool. Again, it just shows the righteousness of the Father. And that attribute is attributed now to Jesus Christ here in Revelation. The pure, righteous, divine quality attribute characteristic of Jesus Christ. And that is ours today. We can be that in Christ. We can be right with the Father right now. In verse 14, we, we now see that Jesus Christ is all-knowing. He's all-seeing. His eyes were like a flame of fire. The significance of that is that Jesus Christ, He sees everything in our life. There's nothing that misses His, his discerning eye. He sees all. We're told in Job, the, there were many verses we could go to. Job 34, God's eyes, His ways are on the ways of a man, and He sees all of His steps. He sees all of His steps. God sees everything that we do. Jesus Christ is aware of and sees everything that we do. There's nothing that misses his eye. That's unnerving. That's challenging. And yet it is so comforting to know that God sees. Because he sees, he can love us like no one else can. He can administer grace to us like no one else can. He can extend mercy to us like no one else can. In Daniel 7, 9, we go back to there. The Father here is portrayed, His throne was fiery flames, and its wheels were burning fire. Again, context, we won't go into all the details. But again, we see that, that discerning authority, that discerning eye of the Father, which is also attributed to Christ. We believe this is Christ in Daniel 10.6. His face like the appearance of lightning, His eyes like flaming torches. Uh, again, we see that description, that, uh, that quality of, being given to Jesus Christ and, and also established here in Revelation. God, the Father, God, the Son, able to see, to know everything in our life. Psalm 139 shows us that beautifully. Hebrews 4.13, no creature is hidden from His sight. We're all naked, we're all exposed to His eye. He sees everything. And so as we're, as we're the, the qualities of Christ are unfolding, we're just, we're, we're, we're able to be comforted because God knows, God sees. Jesus Christ sees all these things. He is the head of the church, but He's our high priest. He brought us into relationship in the first place. He sees us, He knows us, He understands us. He is our righteousness. He is our holiness. Look at all the things that He is, he is doing and has done on our behalf and, and as, as a, an extension of His grace into our life. What an amazing Savior. You have an amazing Savior if you know Jesus Christ this morning. In verse 15, as we continue, John says, His feet were like burnished bronze refined in a fire. One of the qualities that's going to come out here in Revelation is Jesus Christ being revealed as judge over the earth. We see that here. Uh, we pick up, uh, we're reminded here, the significance of this quality is that we will all give account to Jesus Christ. That furnished, that furnished bronze here that we see here is... Um, being refined in a furnace, it, it re takes us to the Holy of Holies and the, and that, and, 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 uh, the bronze laver and, and, and the need for holiness and, and that sacrifice must be given for sin. Hebrews chapter 4, we see this. Uh, we're all going to give an account. The Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, and it discerns our thoughts, discerns everything in our heart, our intentions. No creature is hidden from that discerning, probing eye of, of God Himself. Again in Daniel, we see this. Jesus Christ, his arms, his legs, they were like the gleam of burnished bronze. We have, a, we have a description of Jesus Christ fitting in perfectly with what is being revealed here in the book of Revelation. And, and Jesus Christ is being revealed as, as ultimately the, the judge uh, over our life. We will give an account. Our sins, our life will go through the fire of his discerning eye, believer and unbeliever alike. And our, and our works and our life will be judged through that discerning, righteous, holy lens of God. He is the judge to whom we must give an account. In fact, Jesus, Jesus himself reminds us the Father has given all judgment to the Son. All judgment that will take place. The discerning eye of Jesus Christ that will ultimately be applied 
to our life and against our life and through our life and the evaluation that would take place will be done in the hands of Jesus Christ. He will see all things. We're reminded in Acts, Paul tells us that Jesus Christ, He was appointed by God to be the judge of the living and of the dead. There is no one who has lived in the past, who lives now or will live in the future, who will not come under the, the ultimate discerning eye of Jesus Christ when we stand before Him. He will see all things. To Him we will give an account. His eye is it reveals, refines the deepest things in our life. It cannot be hidden from Him. We see here in verse 15 as well that His uh, voice is is the voice of authority. Now we saw we saw here in in uh, uh, verse 10, John says, "I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet." God was getting the attention of John. When we see the trumpet in Scriptures, we see God getting the attention of mankind. That singular, pure note of, of God, of Jesus Christ, getting our attention at Mount Sinai, whatever it might be when the rapture occurs, He's getting our attention, drawing our attention to Himself. Now that's changed because we see here in verse 15, His voice was like the roar of many waters. That, that conveys to us just, just power and, and uh, authority. It is, it is the image of a, of a huge of Niagara Falls or whatever, many falls coming together, and the water's in power and might just, just rushing over a waterfall. We get that, that sense. And here's the reality is that the truth of the Word of God, it just, it just roars into our life. You know, sometimes it's the small, still voice of God, but when it penetrates your life, when the scriptures touch your life, its impact is large, its impact is life-changing, its impact is huge. It changes us. And it roars, its truth roars against the, the deceit, the lies of our own life, and we are washed and we are cleansed and we are made holy, we are made righteous. And the truth of God just washes into our life. And Jesus Christ, as He speaks, He speaks here with authority. That's what's being conveyed by that word picture. God's truth. Deuteronomy 30, 19. I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse, therefore choose life. The truth of God leaves us with a choice. It roars into the life of humanity, into our culture. Every man, woman, and child is ultimately held accountable to God's truth. And we must make a choice. The authority of God. We encounter it. When we stand before the Lord, every man, woman, and child, we will stand without excuse because we've had an opportunity to experience, to see, to understand the authority of God in creation, in our conscience, ultimately from the Word of God. In Daniel, we see this, that the sound of this, we believe this is Jesus again, the sound of His words was like the sound of a multitude. Again, consistency, harmony in the description that we see here of Christ. It just shows us that Jesus Christ is authority. He is our authority. He is the head of our church, head of the church, to whom we are to yield. And he is the authority in our life. When He speaks, we are to listen. We're going to see that. Verse 16, in His right hand He held seven stars. He's our guardian. He's our shepherd. Here we have Jesus Christ holding these stars. In verse 20, we'll see what are these stars. Uh, the stars are the, are the churches. They're the, they're the messengers. The church is in His hand. The, the pastors are in his hand. We see God holding us in his hand. He's watching over us. He's taking care of us. The significance, the significance is simple. He has us in his hands. When, when we become a child of God, we belong to him. Nothing can change that in our life at all. John 20, I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. Here we have, here we have Jesus Christ in these verses. He's holding his church. He's holding those pastors. He's holding us in relationship. That relationship can never be undone. No one can snatch us out of that relationship. You know, we sin, we struggle, but if we genuinely know Jesus Christ, nothing can take that relationship from us. In fact, Jesus Christ then draws us closer. He brings us to the point of confession, repentance, and He brings us to the place of power and of overcoming and of conforming to the image of Christ. That's what He does. As to the mystery of the seven stars, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. We'll, we'll come back to that. So Jesus Christ, he secures us, he holds us. What a, what a beautiful thing. We see here in verse 16, from his mouth came a two-edged sharp, a sharp two-edged sword. His truth, his truth is irrefutable. His truth 
is unopposable. Uh, it cuts into our life. The significance is the Word of God, which is His Word, is the standard to which we're going to be held accountable. All of us have the Word of God. Whether we read it or not, as a child of God, we're going to be held accountable. Whether we believe it or not, as an unbeliever, we will be held accountable to the standard of the Word of God. The Word of God is the standard for life for all people, every culture, every skin color, every economic social background, doesn't matter what it is, we all are to yield to the truth of God's Word. It is, it is the standard for our life. It is the promise for our life. It is the hope for our life. It is God's, God's truth. And so we're reminded in John that, that when we reject Christ, we are rejecting His words. My words, my words, they have a judge, the words that I have spoken. The words that Jesus Christ has spoken will be the standard against which we will be measured one day. Hebrews again reminds us, that the Word of God penetrates our life, every area, and to that Word we are accountable. Whether it's, uh, whether it's truth coming from creation, whether it's truth coming from our conscience that God has put into our soul, ultimately whether it's truth from the Word of God against which, against which all other truth is measured and defined, we see in chapter 19 of Revelation, from his mouth will come a sharp shore sword from which to strike down the nations. The authority of God's word will render the excuse of man powerless, will render the resistance and rebellion of man powerless. The word of God changes us. Verse 16, his faith was like the sun shining in full strength. Here we see Jesus Christ in holiness and in majesty, in full glory. His face was like the sun, and it's shining in full glaze, at full glory. The significance is this. It's all about Christ. We're to live for Christ and Christ alone. No one else. We're to live for Christ. He is King of kings. He is Lord of lords. He is the authority. He is our Savior. He gave His life for us. It is for Him to whom we are to live. We are reminded in so many verses... Whether we eat, whether we drink, no matter how we live, where we live, what we do, when we do it, or how we do it, we're to do it for the glory of God. It is, his, it is for his, his glory. Uh, that is so Christ. That is so, that is so beautiful. I've been crucified with Christ. See, Paul says, it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. We live for him. We're to live for him. In Isaiah, we get a picture of the glory of God. Looking ahead, the sun shall no more uh, shall be no more your light by day, nor for brightness shall the moon give you light. But the Lord will be your everlasting light. God here, Jesus Christ, will one day give us the light of heaven, the light of glory, the light of eternity. His glory, His power. It is amazing. We see a glimpse of that when Jesus Christ was on the earth. He was transfigured. The glory of God shone momentarily through. Through him, his face shone like the sun. His clothes became white as light. That's what takes place. When, when uh, Saul was on the road to Damascus to kill, to massacre, to kill Christians, his life was transformed because he met Jesus Christ on that road. And it says here, as he's speaking to King Agrippa, giving his testimony of his salvation, he says, I saw on the way a light from heaven brighter than the sun. It was at midday. The sun was already out. It was brighter than the sun, and it shone all around me. And ultimately, we see here it was Jesus Christ. It was Jesus Christ. He's a beautiful thing. We see Jesus Christ in this portrayal. What is he doing? He's holding seven stars in his hand, right? Seven stars in his hand. But when we come to this image, what do we see? We see the glory of God. His face shine like the sun. Where is our focus going? Is it going to the seven stars? No. In this image, our, our focus goes to where? Not to the stars that he's holding. It goes to Jesus Christ. It goes to his face. It goes to him. And it just reminds us that ultimately as we live day by day, we are in the loving care of Jesus Christ. He holds his church. He holds you in, in relationship forever and ever and ever. But the focus of life is not the church. The focus of life is not the pastor. When you go to worship and go to church, the focus should never be me. The focus should never be the pastor. What we should see when we come together to worship is Christ. The focus in our life should not be about us. It should not be about like, uh, drawing people to look at us. The focus here in this image is very clear. He's holding us. He's holding the church, yes. But when we look at Christ, our focus goes to Him. Everything in our life and everything in worship 
if there is a genuineness there and there and there is an authenticity in our hearts and our relationship our our focus is on jesus christ not on each other when the word of god is given and communicated and portrayed it should be christ that is preached not a pastor's opinion not a pastor's agenda when we stand to give testimony in our life with and rub shoulders with others we may be one of these stars we may be a part of the church because we were in relationship but it is christ that they need to see in your life they need to see christ in your life more than they need to see you and i how important that is when we look at christ we forget we are reminded it's not about us it's about jesus christ and yet we're reminded in Isaiah, when he was here and he ministered in his humanity, this is what he looked like. He had no stately form or majesty that might catch our attention. No special appearance that we should want to follow him. It was amazing. Jesus Christ wasn't a, uh, he didn't stop, he didn't stop the traffic with how he looked. He wasn't a, he wasn't a California blonde who looked, who looked just immaculate and was the best looking guy in the block. He was an average looking guy. That's what he was. He didn't draw attention to himself because he was the best looking guy in the room. Isn't that amazing? In humility, he came and he lived among us and he simply looked like everyone else. And yet he was different than everyone else. He was God. And yet John takes that a step further. In humility, we see this portrayal. But John, or Paul reminds us since 2 Corinthians 5, 16, 16 even though we've known Christ... From such a human point of view, we know him from a human point of view. We understand him human, humanly, and the, and, the, and the authors of the gospel knew him face to face. Now we do not know him in that way any longer. We, we see Jesus Christ not just as he was when he was here on earth. We see Jesus Christ now as he is, ascended in glory. Our perspective of Christ needs to change. When we teach uh, young people about Jesus Christ in Sunday school and in life. It's not about just the Jesus Christ who came uh, incarnated in the flesh and the virgin birth and gave his life and died and rose again. It's not just the Jesus Christ of the Gospels. It's the Jesus Christ who fulfills all things in his ruling and reigning today and one day will establish his literal kingdom. It is, that is the Jesus Christ we must also see and look at today we must never forget what he's done for us because that touches our life every day. But we must look ahead at what he is doing for us and what he will complete so that we are reminded of his power, his authority. That's who he is today. Verse 17, and when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Another quality of Jesus that we don't often think about is he is absolutely unapproachable. He is overwhelming. We see in this picture, think about that for a second. His holiness overwhelms John. The holiness of God, the holiness of Jesus Christ, it overwhelms John. Mark 1.24, even the unclean spirits when he ministered. What do you have to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. They were terrified of his holiness. Here John is in awe of his holiness. But all he can do is go to his feet. He is overwhelmed by the righteousness and the holiness of God. We must never forget that that's who Jesus Christ is. He is absolutely and utterly and terribly holy and righteous. We cannot stand before him apart from his loving relationship and grace into our life. We must never forget that that is his quality as well. Isaiah, when he stood before God, woe is me, I am un. I am lost, I'm a man of unclean lips, because I've seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Even messengers who would come to Daniel, angels, angelic messengers that came to Daniel would bring that sense of awe. And they were simply messengers of God. We look in the Gospels and we see the Magi bow before Jesus Christ. We see unclean spirits bow in terror. We see Peter, after the miracle of catching fish, he says, uh, he says, depart from me. I'm an unclean man. He's, he's, he's in awe of the holiness of Jesus. He is, he is, it touches his heart with brokenness. The betrayers of Jesus Christ, when Jesus simply says, I am, he, they fell to their feet before him. On the road to Damascus, we have Saul. Philippians 2.10, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. We will bow before Christ someday. 
And yet here's the beautiful thing. He's caring. He's accessible. But see, here's the thing. He laid his, his right hand on me and He said, don't be afraid. Fear not. The same Jesus Christ who is unapproachable, the same Jesus Christ who is holy, because we are sinful sinners, we cannot approach the holiness of God, is the very same one who, because He shed His blood on the cross for us, and stood in our place and gave us relationship, and now is the same one who says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He's the same one that invites us into relationship. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He's speaking to believers there. Come back into fellowship. He's saying to me, to you in your life, He touches your life with grace. He says, Don't be afraid of me. On this one hand, He says, You should absolutely be afraid of me and respect me because I am holy. To me, you will give account. On the other side, He says, Don't be afraid. Come to me because by coming to me, you are coming to the very one who gives you the ability to be conformed to my image. You are coming to the very one who will love you into a relationship. You are coming to the very one who will give you the grace and extend mercy that is undeserved so that you can walk with Jesus Christ. What beautiful picture we have here. Jesus Christ is our righteousness. We can't approach Jesus Christ because of our sin. We can approach Jesus Christ because He is now our righteousness. That's what we have here. And so Isaiah tells us, don't be afraid. Fear not. Don't be dismayed. I am your God. I will strengthen you, help you, uphold you with what? My righteous right hand. I will apply my righteousness to you. I will help you in righteousness. Huh. Isn't that beautiful? Verse 17, I am the first and the last. Jesus Christ is divine. He is eternally divine. Jesus is God. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. All these, all these, all these pairs speak to the Father, they speak to the Son. We're reminded in John when the gospel was just started, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. We have God the Father, we have God the Son in total equality and essence there in that verse. Jesus is God. Exodus 3, God says to Moses, Who shall I tell Pharaoh is sending me? God says, I am who I am. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Jesus Christ said in the Gospels, before Abraham was, I am. Applying the same divine name to himself as was applied to his father and revealed in Christ in the Old Testament. Verse 18, and he is the living one. He's the source of life. He is our source of life. The significance is this, Jesus Christ, he alone is life. Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes into relationship. No one comes to the father. No one, no one has life with the Father except through me. Whoever has a Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, he was, he, was, he was separated from God. He lost his kingdom. He was driven into his sanity, and God restored him. And then he worships God here. You are the Most High. You are praised and honor, and I honor the one who lives forever. The very description of Christ himself as well. John 5, 26, as a father has life in himself, so has he granted the son also to have life in himself. Beautiful. Verse 18, I died and behold, I am alive forever. He has conquered death. He has conquered death in our life. Jesus has overcome. How significant that's going to be in the coming verses. How significant these attributes, these qualities will be to those who are reading this letter. I am the resurrection and the life. We are to come to him in faith. We are to believe this is who he says he is. He died for our sins. He was buried. He rose again on the third day. He is life. He conquered death. He overcame. He's going to call us to be overcomers. But you see what? He's already overcome. The most challenging task, the most challenging trial, the most challenging uh, hardship or adversity we could ever face has already been won because Jesus Christ won that in his own life. Now he gives you the same power to overcome. Verse 18b, I have the keys of death and of Hades. He seals, he secures the destiny of man. 
It is in His hand. Christ is our deliverance. He is our only de deliverance. He holds, holds the keys of death and Hades. Death is, the, death is the condition of man, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. That's our condition. The condition of man is we are under the curse of death. We will die physically. We are dead spiritually until we encounter Jesus Christ and believe in Him. Our God is a God of salvation, and to God the Lord belong deliverances, from death, and He is the God of Hades. That is the location. That is where that is where we go. It is many 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 elements of what that is after we die, separated or with God. Romans fourteen, Paul reminds us: Jesus Christ died; He lived again, that He might be the Lord both of the dead and the living. The dead will live again. We will live again. Unbeliever will live again, but separated from Christ. Believers will live again but in relationship with Jesus Christ. He is Lord of both. He says to John, so write, write therefore the things that you have seen, those that are, those that are to take place after this. What you've seen, what is, and what's about to take place. Again, the breakdown of Revelation. We see John's writing about those things that we've seen, the things that are, going to that are and the things that are going to take place. Chapters 6 to the end of the book. He is our eternal authority. He has always been. He always will be. His word is truth. He says to John, write these things. Write down these things. We are to respond to God. As he speaks into our life. We're to respond to his written word. He says to John, don't write your opinion. Don't, don't write what you think you saw. Write down what I tell you. Write down what I tell you. Revelation reminds us we're not to take away, we're not to add to the words of this book, of this prophecy. He says to John, John, write what you see. Don't add to it. Don't make the story bigger than it is. Don't embellish. Write what you see. Write what I give you. And, and John, don't leave anything out that I want you to write. And he says to us, we're not to add to anything to this book, to the book of Revelation specifically, to his word ultimately. We're not to take anything away from his book. It is his word. He says, write. He says, write. We're to, we're to listen. We're to read His Word. This is His Word. Ultimately, not just the book of Revelation, but also the, the Word of God in, in total. That's what we're to do. We're to, we're to read His Word. We are to hear it. And we're to keep it. And then in verse 20, we see this as well. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw on my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. He is the revealer of mysteries. That's what he's doing. He's unveiling. He's revealing a mystery here. Boy, life is full of mystery, isn't it? Before we speak to that, just let us speak to this one element here. He says, and the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. What is that word angels? It's angelos is the word in the Greek. It means messenger. In the book of Revelation, it's always applied to angels that God created, the angels that He created. Yet, yet in this context, this word angelos can also be used to speak to human messengers, to real people in, in the Scriptures. There are a number of occasions, occasions where that is true as well. In this context, the, the idea that it's an angel, created angel, doesn't seem to fit because, number one, in Scripture, we never see context as king. The context of Revelation is this word is used for angels. But the context of Scripture and the context of this passage has impact on the use of this word. Because in the context of this passage, Jesus Christ is being portrayed and he's setting up the letters that are going to go to the seven churches. He's speaking to the angels of these seven churches. Angels are never given leadership over or in a church. We never see that in the scripture. Angels don't have leadership in the church. He also reprimands these messengers. He reprimands these churches. He never reprimands his angels. There was a rebellion that took place at the beginning of creation. That's done. Now there are those who serve Satan and those who serve God. Those who serve God are never reprimanded. Those who serve Satan are already under a curse. Jesus Christ here is reprimanding these messengers for how they're leading their church. Angels never lead the church. They have influence over the church. They maybe are uh, 
resources and power in the hands of God, but they never lead the church. God uses people to lead his church. He uses us. These are most likely elders and pastors that he's referring to. The significance is the mysteries. What is unknown is going to be revealed through Christ. What is unknown will be known. Ephesians 1, God made known to us the mystery of his will according to the purpose that he set forth in Christ. He makes it known to us through Christ. It is fulfilled in Christ. The Lord does nothing without revealing his secret to his servants, the prophets. He always communicated with his prophet. John is a prophet. Here, he's functioning as a prophet. He's giving prophecy. He's showing to us. God is, is revealing his secret, his plan, his program to John. Now, there are many things that the prophets are never told, many things that we as man can never understand. But as God is, is carrying out his program in history, he's always communicating to humanity through his prophets. That's what he does. And Daniel, to you, O King Nebuchadnezzar, you have encountered a God who reveals ministries. He's sharing to you what's about to take place in this vision that he has. The king answers at the end of that. It's amazing. God is God of gods and Lord of lords. He's a revealer of mysteries. When we come to the scriptures, we're doing the same thing. We're saying, Lord, search me. God, know me. Every area of my life, my thoughts, my heart. Because see, when God knows us completely as he does, he's able then to reveal his truth into every crevice and every corner. There are things that are mysterious to us. Tomorrow is mysterious to us. We don't know what's going to happen. Before it happens, we don't know. We don't know God's plan for our country, for our future. We don't know those things God does. And he reveals wisdom into our life so that we can walk faithfully every day. Walk with confidence. Revelation, we're simply reminded, as God is unveiling his truth and revealing his truth, we're to, we're to obey it. We're to walk in it. We're to keep it. We're to hear it. We're to listen. He says, he who has an ear to hear, let him listen. Let us listen to what the Spirit of God has to say. We're to listen and we're to respond from our heart to God's truth. There are mysteries every day, but yet we are in clear relationship with Jesus Christ. He reveals to us what we need to know so that we can walk faithfully. He knows your heart. He knows mine. The call here in this passage is this. You know, when we read the Word of God, it really challenges us. It speaks to our heart. Um, it convicts us of sin. He calls us to, re to repentance. He calls us to change. He calls us to conform to His image. He calls us to let go of things that we want to control. At the same time, He, he shows us the confidence that we can have in Him. Because of all these attributes, all these displays of power that belong to Christ, because these things are true, we have confidence to that we are in relationship. We can be in relationship, that we can be overcomers, we can walk in victory. His mercy and His grace, His power is available to us every day. He's walking with you today. These things that are, that are true of Him, they are true for you in your life. He says, trust me, and I will do these things in your life. As you read the Word of God, God's desire is that we hear it, we read it, we keep it in our life. That's what God's wanting us to do. He's about to write to seven churches, chapter 2 and 3, what he's going to write. There will be the necessity of a response to it. The basis of that response will be not only the words that are written and the truth of those words, the basis for that response will be how they perceive Christ, how they perceive the, accord, the authority of Christ, how we respond to Jesus Christ. It's based upon how we perceive his authority in our life how we perceive who he is in our life. John's just shown us a portrayal of who Jesus Christ really is. Is that your view of Christ today? Is he awesome and great in your life? Will you follow him with your whole heart? My prayer is that you and I, that we will do that. Lord, guide us to that end, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us. Come back next week. We'll step into these letters as we begin to look at these seven churches. We'll see you next week.